Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Union. The motion before the House tonight is This House Believes the Path to Success is Straight, which is held in accordance with LGBT History Month. To open for the proposition, we have Lieutenant Commander Mandy McBain. She joined the Royal Navy in 86 and has since been appointed an Equality and Diversity Officer. She established and is chair of the Naval Service LGBT Forum. So, Mandy, thank you for opening. When I started looking into this, I found that to be successful really depended on how you um, define success. It may be a level of social status, an achievement or a goal, the achievement of something desired or attempted, or really just the opposite of failure. We're only two months into this year and already I feel quite dis slightly disheartened. If I was moving, thinking of moving from the south coast where I live, I might think twice about moving to the capital, as it's been reported that homophobic incidents have risen by 28%. 1,500 were reported there last year. I might avoid Scotland as well, because apparently there's been a five-fold increase in homophobic bullying in the past five years. If I was thinking about becoming a parent, I might also feel quite saddened by what Bernardo's have just discovered in their latest survey, as... Um, one third of the adults questioned said they thought that same-sex parents were worse than heterosexual parents. If I needed medical treatment on my feet, I might want to avoid Peterborough, which is obviously just up the road, as it was recently reported that a podiatrist refused to treat a gay person. If I wanted to pursue a sport, it wouldn't be football, as in 2010 it was voted the least gay-friendly sport. And on top of all of that, if I needed a holiday, I might have to think very carefully about where to go and where I could be open with my partner, and I'd certainly avoid that Cornish village. So, is the road to success straight? Well, taking into account what I've just mentioned, the added challenges of having to look after my personal safety, the standards of service I might receive, people's attitudes towards me, being able to join in with a team or a sport, perhaps the road is easier if you are straight. But again, as I said, it depends on what you're trying to succeed in. When I joined the Women's Royal Naval Service back in 1986, as it was called then, things were very different than they are today. Women couldn't go to sea. Women were not armed. Women couldn't remain in the service if they had children. And women couldn't wear trousers as part of their uniform. And on top of all of that, people were dismissed from the service if they were found to be gay. So you might quite rightly ask, why did I join? Well, looking briefly at my naval career, my personal journey has been one of ignorance is bliss in the beginning because I didn't realise I was gay. And then the stark reality of being a lesbian in a service where if I had been discovered, I would have dis been dishonourably discharged. As I joined as a junior rate with a burning ambition to become an officer, this made my plans look and seem very fragile at times. I've now been in for 24 years. I've been promoted to a Lieutenant Commander. I've fulfilled my ambition to become an officer. Therefore, I've succeeded. But I've failed to be promoted any further. Is this because I was a lesbian in an organisation that openly endorsed institutionalised direct discrimination? The policies, the practices, the rules and regulations were all set at a default to support heterosexuals. And in the early years, male heterosexuals. Therefore, to succeed, I had to appear straight, to be satisfied with a very limited career path as a woman in what appeared to be very much a man's navy. I was part of an establishment where I was forced to take on the organisational norms of being heterosexual, forced to follow a straight path. Why didn't I leave? Very good question. I was young, I was ambitious, and simply had no other career aspirations. However, to, in order to remain in the Navy at that time, I had to lead a double life, conform to the expected norm. Struggling to come to terms with my sexuality was difficult enough, but doing it on my own felt very, very lonely. I was away from home, and in the Navy, we not only work together, we eat together, we socialise together, we share sleeping space, sometimes in large mess decks, 
share ablutions and generally live together 24-7, sometimes for months on end in very trying circumstances. Due to this very unique lifestyle, gossip was often rife. I felt I couldn't trust anyone, close friends, family, and I didn't know of any support groups. I really didn't know where to turn. Therefore, I carried on. I became quite an actress. I had fictitious boyfriends back at home, learned to be careful in conversations, not acknowledging anyone's gender, hiding the real me from friends, work colleagues, and more importantly, the special investigation branch. I know now if I'd been allowed to use this energy on my career and not a real life soap opera, I would have been far more productive, more ambitious, happier, and given the Navy a much better return for the money that they were investing in me. For the first 14 years, I was very much undeveloped. During my time in the Navy, I've seen an immense amount of changes in the way the service treats its people, its women, its gays. But these changes have often been made reluctantly, forced on the MOD by the European Court of Human Rights, legislation, financial and personnel constraints. That said, the rules changed in 2000 to allow gay people to serve alongside their colleagues, as they always had done. There was an overarching feeling amongst the hierarchy, though, that it was tolerated and it should be treated as a private matter. This mindset, the attitude of being tolerated, made it difficult for us to feel completely accepted. Yet again, putting up another barrier. This bar barrier meant for many people it felt safer to remain in the closet, appear to be on the straight path to success. I had to wrestle with my own conscience, knowing for the best part of 14 years I'd lied to close friends, bosses I'd respected and who respected me, and I was really worried about how I'd be accepted. The irreversible risk was one that in the early days I really wasn't willing to take. There was still too much risk, and even for some, the risk is too high even today. Even now, the added challenges that non-straits in the service have to consider are every two to three years we move different to different jobs. Therefore, it's up to us whether we go through that whole coming out procedure again. Some people do, and some people choose it's too much of a risk. Our straight colleagues don't have to consider this. We don't know how we might be accepted by those that we have to live with on a 24-7 basis, or our report writers, our bosses, the people that can make a difference to our careers. I'm now in a position when I can be open and out about my sexuality. I'm confident. I have the luxury of age, experience, rank, seniority, and that all this reinforces my own moral courage. <coughs> You could say I've now been allowed to succeed. However, that said, I did find myself choosing to restrict what information I gave to others as recently as 2009. This was probably down to me wanting to be accepted, wanting to be liked, not wanting to have to go through justifying myself again. It's sort of self-protection, I guess. In early 2009, I experienced, I experienced this isolation firsthand. I was appointed to Bosnia to be the EU forces spokesperson in Sarajevo. This meant I was in a very unfamiliar job in a mainly Muslim country, and I knew little about it. I was only one of two females in the UK contingent, and the UK contingent was only 12 on a camp of 2,000. I was working with 25 other nations, many of which didn't recognise or support LGB people in their military. I didn't feel comfortable being 100% myself. It was easier to follow the straight path, the norms, what was expected of me. Whilst I don't feel I needed to shout about my sexuality, it would have been nice not to invest the time and effort into hiding it once again. In the Navy, I, along with many others, have at times felt immense amount of pressure due to my sexuality. The feeling of isolation that I've felt at times has not been helped by being part of an organisation where attitudes have been very slow to change. Changes to the rules and the regulations have been unhurried, <laughs> measured, and often had, and still at times now, have to be completely and carefully justified to the heterosexual majority. Some gay people are still worried about being accepted in the services, worried about attitudes towards them, 
They understandably don't want to experience discrimination or be stigmatised. What I don't know, and what is not measurable, is the impact all of this has had on my career. That can never be measured. Appearing to be on a straight path to success is easier. Investing time and energy in hiding the real me from those people has not been worth it. I'm out now, true to myself, confident and very happy. I have succeeded, but the level of success has been a fight. However, what I've gained is something of greater value. I now feel I live my life with integrity. So I do believe the path to success is easier to be straight. Thank you, Mandy. To open for the opposition, we have Lord Chris Smith. He is Chairman of the Environmental Agency and a life peer in the House of Lords. He is a former Labour MP and Cabinet Minister. He was also the UK's first openly gay MP and President of the Cambridge Union in Michaelmas 1972. So, Chris, thank you very much. Uh, Madam President, uh, fellow members, uh, it is uh, a great pleasure to be back. It's also a great pleasure to be introduced so elegantly. Um, I, when I was uh, Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport, I was uh, speaking at one uh, particular dinner. And because the title of the department was a little bit of a mouthful, I had to begin my speech by saying that I was actually the last member of Cabinet who should be introduced as the Secretary of Straight. Um, uh, however, um, uh, let's be clear from the outset what this debate isn't about. Uh, it is not about the fact that there are many, many parts of the world, far too many parts of the world, where homophobia is rife, is celebrated, uh, and uh, is uh, very detrimental to the people who live in those parts of the world. You have only to look at uh, what's been happening in uh, recent months in Uganda uh, to know that that is absolutely the case. There are some countries who are part of the European Union uh, who still uh, do not uh, afford uh, their lesbian and gay citizens the same rights as they do to others. Uh, all of us on both sides of this debate accept that reality. We also have to recognise that there's still, even here in the UK, a lot of discrimination. Uh, there's much less than there was, but there are still people who are abused, who are shouted at, who are bullied, who are offensively joked about, who are assaulted, who are maimed, and even, in some cases, killed because of their sexuality. Uh, there are still major parts of our establishment, as only to look at both the Church of England and the Catholic Church, uh, to know that there is still a lot of homophobia there. Um, but that is part of the reality. It is not the whole reality. I think we also have to recognise that there has been huge progress in the establishment of equal rights for lesbians, gay men, bisexuals, and to a lesser extent, but still in some real ways, transgender uh, people, uh, over the course of the last 20 or 30 years. It's 26 uh, years ago uh, that I publicly came out uh, for the first time uh, in uh, the town of Rugby. It was a big rally that had been called to protest at the removal from the list of things that Rugby Council had said it would not discriminate against in its employment policies. And they were removing sexual orientation from that list. So they were deliberately going in a reverse direction from equality. Big rally. And I remember walking into the hall with about a thousand people there and uh, thinking, well, Actually, the central point I want to make 
is about the job that anyone can do, whether they are gay or straight. And so I stood up and began my speech by saying, my name's Chris Smith, I'm the uh, Labour MP for Islington South and Finsbury, and I'm gay. Uh, at which point uh, uh, I got the, f the first and only standing ovation I've ever had in the middle of a speech. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, the, um, uh, the response I had to that uh, was wonderful. Uh, I had letters from all around the country over the next uh, few days, uh, many of them saying congratulations, well done. Uh, the ones which meant the most were the ones that said thank you, it's made it easier for me. And um, there was a wonderful moment, um, uh, a uh, a uh, week or so later in my constituency, I was at the opening of a new uh, uh, council housing estate. Now, th this does show how long ago it was uh, that uh, a new council housing estate was being uh, built, let alone opened. Um, uh, and a lady came up to me and she said uh, she had a problem with uh, moving into her new flat and she needed some help from Social Security and could I help? So I took down all the details and said, yes, of course, I'd be delighted to help. Um, and she gave me all the details and then I said, but you need to tell me your name. And she suddenly got terribly embarrassed and she said, oh, well, Mr. Smith, I'm, I'm, I'm so embarrassed. I, I, oh, I, I, I've, I've read all about you, you know. Um, I, my name's Mrs. Gay, um, uh, which she then uh, followed up wonderfully by saying, and I think you're wonderful. Um, <laughs> I, at the time, though, it did feel quite lonely. I was the only member of the House of Commons for years uh, who was openly gay. It was a time when uh, customs and excise were raiding gay is the word bookshop to impound books which had been illegally imported because of the uh, sexual nature of their content. It was uh, the days when section 28 was being put onto the statute book, deliberately labelling gay relationships as second class. Uh, it was uh, the days when the offices of Capital Gay Newspaper in London were being firebombed and there was a Conservative MP in the House of Commons who, when this was referred to on the floor of the House of Commons, shouted out, quite right, too. I, th these were days when it was actually rather difficult to be openly gay. Just roll forward 26 years and think where we are now. Uh, we have an equal age of consent. Section 28 has been removed from the statute book. Uh, it is now perfectly possible for open lesbians and gay men to serve in the diplomatic service in most branches of administration in the armed services. Mandy would now, if she was starting out her career, have a much easier time than she did. Uh, there are joint tenancy rights. There are civil partnerships. Uh, there is equal access to goods and services. There are common adoption laws for straights and gays. There has been huge progress over the course of that uh, 26 years. And there are other signs of progress as well. When I was appointed as a cabinet minister uh, in 1997, I, I, I think I'm right in saying that I was the first openly gay cabinet minister of any country anywhere in the world. The wonderful thing was no one noticed. There was no comment about the fact that this gay man had been appointed to the cabinet. There were lots of profiles about who had been appointed and who was going to do what and who was serving in what job. But the fact that a gay man had been appointed passed almost without notice or comment. That, to me, showed that we had made considerable progress. And I pay considerable tribute, uh, not just to people in my own uh, party, but to many of the gay Tories, uh, some of whom are now in important ministerial positions. And now, of course, uh, we have uh, what seems to me the, the biggest bit of progress 
uh, that we've made in recent years, the establishment of civil partnerships. When civil partnerships were introduced and when the first civil partnerships took place, uh, it was almost even in the tabloid press as if it were a mood of national celebration that something that was right had been done. I even quite liked the Sun headline, uh, which you will, of course, recall uh, was Elton takes David up the aisle. Um, the, um, so we have actually come a long way. And uh, it's not just because legislation has changed. It's not just because administrative provision has changed. It's because underlying social attitudes have changed, that all of that has become possible. And that's the fundamental reason why I urge that you should oppose this motion. But there's something else too. I'm simply not prepared to accept the premise on which the motion is based. Yes, in some professions, some walks of life, it's still more difficult to succeed if you're gay. In others, the barriers have been well and truly demolished. But we shouldn't accept the barriers. We shouldn't ever see them as a fact of life. We should reject them, challenge them, seek to demolish them wherever we find them. We should reaffirm the fundamental principle that just because someone is lesbian or gay or bisexual or transgendered doesn't mean that they aren't every bit as valid as anyone else as citizens in our country and as members of our community. And that, deep down, is why I urge you to join us in opposing this motion. Thank you very much, Chris. To continue for the proposition, we have Reverend Scott Rennie, who is the Minister of Queen's Cross Church in Aberdeen and is openly gay. He was Stonewall's Hero of the Year in 2009, so thank you very much, Scott. Madam President, despite his valiant efforts, uh, Lord Smith uh, remains to convince me, and I hope you too, to oppose this motion. On this we agree, there has been great progress over the last decades. But if we are to be determined to break down the many barriers that remain, we have to first acknowledge that they still exist. Madam President, we know that the path to success still far too often in this country is straight. In his survey of recent history and progress, Lord Smith seems to have had his rose-coloured spectacles on. And while in his case that's particularly understandable as a former Labour minister, I'm afraid it seems to have impaired his vision of the realities for gay men and lesbian women seeking success in their careers, for example. As I expected, his list of achievements overlooked two core arguments. First of all, for those of us who live outside of the metropolitan southeast bubble, the yellow brick road of dreams, which all friends of Dorothy labour on, is most definitely still straight. Madam President, there's barely a bend in it. Maybe one or two. Outside of metropolitan London and the southeast, especially, finding success in their field of employment remains a much harder task for gay men and women. It's understandable that we should hear such metropolitan views expressed, and I might say I don't in any way seek to detract from Lord Smith's own remarkable achievements in his working life. But the fact remains, doesn't it, that it is much easier to 
success is much easier to achieve for people in the LGB community in metropolitan areas, or those working, say, for corporations, than it is for those of us who live in, shall we say, the more peripheral parts of this land. Madam President, it remains the case that the path to success is straight all over this green and pleasant land. And nor is it simply a matter of geography, but it's also very dependent on one's sphere of life and work. I can see how, if I were a media lovey living in London, things might look somewhat different. But as an example of just how straight the path remains, let me offer my own sphere of life, the high calling of ecclesiastical service. Now, any clergyman would testify to this house that when a vacancy arises in a parish, be it south or north of the border, in England, in Scotland, or in Wales, there is nothing that people love more in the rectory than a family. If one has, uh, has an ambition in life, as even humble clerics do, to climb that greasy ecclesiastical pole, a good wife and family are a distinct advantage. No question about it. When your parish at home has been vacant, looking for a new rector, how often have you heard fellow parishioners say over a nice cup of Earl Grey, oh, I do hope the next vicar is a gay man and he has a nice partner? <laughs> exactly. Never. Never. Moreover, in the established churches of this nation, we have plenty documented evidence over the last number of years that success for gay men and lesbians remains a forlorn hope. Only straits will do. The Church of England, for instance, is fortunate to have such an exceptionally talented man, such as Geoffrey John, the Dean of St Albans, amongst its clergy. There is no question where he a straight man, he would have been able to reach the pinnacle of a bishop's see. This house knows he would not have been persuaded, shall we say, to withdraw his nomination as Bishop of Bangor. Would his name have been preemptively leaked to the press as a possible Bishop of Southwark had not someone hoped to scotch any possible appointment? And continuing on an Anglican theme, uh, and as far as churches goes, it's far more for gays and lesbians uh, in the Anglican church. Two years ago, I had the pleasure of uh, meeting Jean Robinson, the Bishop of New Hampshire. He and I share a few things in common. One is that we had to have security guards present at our installation. His as a bishop, uh, myself as a humble parish minister in Aberdeen. How many straight clergymen require a security firm to be present at their installation in case uh, things get out of hand? None that I know of. Far from opening the gates for other gay men and women, sadly, across the wider Anglican Communion, if not in the United States, the policy the possibilities seem to be uh, looking slimmer than they did even five years ago. One can't help but feel, in our sphere of life, things are actually moving backwards. The House may already know that in my own denomination, the Church of Scotland, my election to be minister of a broadly liberal parish in the west end of Aberdeen was met with fevered opposition because I have the audacity to love and live with my partner. What is normally a mere formality, the rubber stamping of my appointment by the presbytery, became a long protracted and, uh, debacle in which my vocation and life was dragged through the courts of the church and through the national media. Now had I been elected or called to a small rural, out rural outpost or a very unsexy urban priority area, I doubt there would have been such an unholy row. But to be called by an influential, tall steeple, wealthy church was in the eyes of many of my colleagues flaunting it. And so they caused an unholy row. So in ecclesiastical circles, even where to be gay is tolerated, there is an expectation that we'll, one will not have uh, two grand ideas in terms of one's postings. I've used for my evidence that the present situation in our two great national churches in the UK means that uh, the establishment in this case is not even such a mellowing influence. Often uh, the situation for the LGBT community in these established churches is worse. 
Madam President, my point is this. The fact that some do succeed, and succeed well, even in an unforgiving and difficult environment, is more of a testament to their own grit and sheer determination. The fact that my case and the far more courageous actions of others in recent history have made the news headlines only goes to affirm the assertion of this side of the House that it remains the case that essentially in the world the path to success is straight. Far be it from me to rain on our opposition's parade or to dismiss in this LGBT History Month, the progress that has been made, as Lord Smith rightly claimed, in the last number of years. But to be so complacent as to pretend that things are really better than they are would be a huge mistake and a disservice to our community up and down the land, especially those of us who live in more parochial parts of the country, for whom the path to success remains a very difficult one to travel. Madam President, one is mindful of that great leader of the Hebrew people, Moses, who got to the top of the mountain and saw the promised land, even though he knew he would never enter it. We, yes, may have seen flashes of that promised land in the achievements of many in the LGBT community. But let's not kid ourselves. We have a long, long way to go before we can say we have crossed over the Jordan. I urge the House to support the motion. Thank you, Scott. To continue for the opposition, we have Femi Artidoju, who is the founder and training director at Challenge Consultancy, which helps organisations embed equality and diversity into their culture. She campaigns widely for race, gender and sexuality equality. So, Femi, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to speak. I had to come... There's so much wrong with this motion, I hardly know where to begin. I feel like one of those actors called to an audition who's required to say the same line over again, saying, putting different emphasis on different bits of the word to get as many different meanings out of the sentence as they can. The road to success is straight, like there's just one road to success. No, there isn't. I'll come back to that one. The road to success is straight, as though success were a destination that you could get to by getting on the right road, like, I'm going to Duxford Airfield, if I get on the M11, I'll get there. <laughs> Actually, you can get to Duxford Airfield on the 505 or the A103, or something like that. And let me tell you, the A103 is not straight. <laughs> the road to success is straight, the road to success is straight, as though... To be straight is what gets you in the right direction. Being straight can get you away from success as well. Actually being, taking the straight road can be bad for you. So I offer all of this up in evidence against the motion. I'm going to leave the rest of the emphasis thing to people like Thandie Newton who would do it so much better. I'm going to go on to the notion of success. I think that's difficult in and of itself. Mandy already mentioned different people have different ideas of what success is. My typically Nigerian education mad mother thinks I'm a failure because I didn't read medicine. She says, you have a good brain, you have sense, you refuse to do anything decent with this thing. It's interesting because I think my failure to read medicine is a success. I've avoided becoming yet another member of the Otichoju clan who's medically qualified. We've got a surfeit of them in Nigeria. <laughs> And I run my own business, so I think I'm a success. Who's right? Many parents wring their hands, berate themselves and ask themselves, where did we go wrong because their young person has turned out to be lesbian or gay? And then other parents pat themselves on the back, nod knowingly at one another because their young person is comfortable enough to come out to them as being lesbian or gay. Who's the successful one? I think that success is so varied, it's really difficult to say, this thing is successful, that thing is not. Am I successful if I make it to one of the world's oldest universities? Am I successful if I make a lot of money, get a good job, 
Am I successful if I manage to negotiate a pact with the Conservatives and get to the role of Deputy Prime Minister, even if my party thinks I've sold out? You could look at success as um, achieving your own goals, and even that means that they're going to vary a lot from person to person. For some of us, those goals involve living openly and comfortably as lesbian or gay. To our minds, success is out, gay and proud. A year ago, this week, a thousand young people, 16-year-olds, were asked, what do you want to be? when you're older. Over half of them, 54%, said famous. Only 9% wanted a legal career, 13% wanted to work in the media, and just 15% said they wanted to go into medicine. See, look, failures already. <laughs> so I want to go forward with this very modern view of success. I want to add it to this old lady's view of success about achieving your own personal goals and just look at some people who've really, I think, proven to us that the road is to success is not straight. Prepare for a roll call. It's actually this road, it's very far from straight. There's lots of things that the road to success can be called and straight is probably the least applicable. There's more than one road, I've established that. Look at, let's go back a bit, contrast Someone like Radcliffe Hall, who wrote The Well of Loneliness and lived really quietly in the little sleepy East Sussex village of Rye, and then contrast, contrast her with somebody like uh, the militant Quentin Crisp. So Radcliffe Hall writes and persuades people and wins their hearts and minds through her, their poetry and her prose, and uh, Quentin Crisp confronts people on the street, challenges their prejudices. They both took different roads, they're both successful, neither of them took the straight road. Success has such stark contrasts, doesn't it, in the people that we can see, the ones that are held up to us, the ones who have succeeded through fame or through reaching their own goals. The very elegant and lovely Mary Portis, statuesque, forthright, outspoken, and the diminutive, softly spoken, Sarah Walters, who persuades people through her store, magic storytelling and things like tipping the velvet. Different roads, equal success, neither road straight. I think also to claim the road to success is straight also means to claim that it's narrow. And that road had to accommodate me the sublime divine from Hairspray, Beth Ditto. Oh no, the road to straight, the road to success is not narrow. It's extremely wide indeed. I think the road to success is not straight. It's convoluted. There are numerous people who've had to negotiate all manner of obstacles to get to success. And not all of us have lived in the city and not all of us have had privileged backgrounds. The filmmaker, Isaac Julien, a young, squat, not very pretty, very, very black man from the council estate in Brixton, from local, little social misfit to Turner Prize nominee. Boy George, from the not very well-regarded Jesus Loves You group, harboring unrequited secret love for his fellow band member, blossoms when he comes out, turns into the proper gender bender that he is, embraces his sexuality. The road to success isn't straight. Jackie Kay, little quiet village just outside Stirling in Scotland, transracially adopted, not supported, no metrosexuality, just a woman who's willing to be out and therefore able to succeed. Taking the straight road can be bad for you, you know. It, uh, it can damage your mental health. Michael Barrymore blames alcohol dependency on his straight facade. Alcohol and drug dependency 
mental health issues and other related problems are overrepresented amongst members of the LGB community, in particular those who are LGB but not actually part of the community, the ones that are isolated, the ones don't, that don't manage to come out. That's the straight road and it's not successful. There isn't a road to success. There isn't one on any atlas, any map. It doesn't appear in any satellite navigation system. There isn't one. It defies definition. Actually, thinking about it for a while, I thought perhaps the road to success might actually be a cycle lane that crisscrossed the UK. Well, definitely the South East, and then a bit further up the UK, bits of Europe, and potentially the whole world. And I think it's a cycle lane because it's a path that's been burned by Peter Tatchell. And he cycles absolutely everywhere. And he's very, very successful. If your measure is perhaps other than fame, other than your own goals, if your measure is touching the lives and affecting other people. Yes, these days the road to success is out. Out and supporting others, like Sir Ian McClellan. Out and doing a job effectively, like Chris Smith, like uh, Anna Eagle MP. The road to success, for me, started, I think, when I was seven, when my auntie caught me playing nurses and nurses with my cousin. And she smacked me and I said, I'm not sorry, I'm a lesbian. She said I didn't know what it meant, but I did. I took another step on the road to success when I filled in my, what was then called, Ucker form in 1975 and wrote, I'm a lesbian and got four offers, no interviews, just like that. The road to success grew wider for me when I wrote that I was a lesbian on every single application form that I filled in, mentioned it at every single interview that I went to, and never ever pretended that I was anything other than a big black dyke. And no one ever said no to me. To conclude, then, the first road to success may have been straight, but let me tell you, it's been reworked in yellow brick, it's been fabulously lit, and it's been set to music. <laughs> To conclude, there's more than one road to success, and for the 3.6 million people that the government has estimated happen to be LGB in the UK at the moment, the straight road is too narrow to lead to success. Thank you. Thank you, Fermi. Um, at this point in the debate, we open to the floor. If you'd like to make a point, please state your name and college and keep your point to one minute. Do we have a point in proposition of the motion? No one has any opinions? Go on. Um, I'd just like to ask uh, a point made by yourself that perhaps the fact that we are like, celebrating these individual achievements, which are really fantastic achievements, <coughs> is an indication like is indicating that there is a wider problem, the fact that these achievements are sort of, of like super games. They are they are gay people who have managed to overcome all of the social barriers that are that are in the way. <coughs> Somehow they sort of make us pretend that the barriers aren't there. Is it more dangerous to pretend that that the barriers aren't there? Because for the majority of the population outside of say, the metropolitan bubble, like being gay is actually a genuinely a, a, a problem on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you. Is there a point in opposition? Duncan? Hi. Um, you don't know what's going to say, college. Um, I think on the, on the uh, proposition for this, for this um, debate, We've had a, um, a member of the armed forces and a clerk, both of whom are gay. 
And I'd like to suggest that these perhaps aren't representative of, of a normal career, and that they probably are slightly more homophobic than your day-to-day -day job. And I hope I'm not the only one who was quite inspired by the last speech and the optimism that it, that it presented. And I think that kind of optimism is what we should be seeking to, um, to, to embody and to champion, not the, um, not the kind of uh, pessimism uh, that, that, the, uh, uh, that the proposition that can embody.
continuing positive message that there are many different ways to success. Turn to the main debate. To close for the proposition, we have le retired Lieutenant Commander Craig Jones, who was the most senior openly gay member of Her Majesty's Armed Forces, where he served until 2008. He received an MBE <laughs> for driving change and encouraging greater understanding of the gay community. So, Craig, thank you very much. Madam President, my Lord, members, ladies and gentlemen, Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you tonight about something which is very important. And it's fabulous to hear the realism in the room, and I particularly refer to the last question about the fact that there are practical challenges which have faced gay men and women for centuries. Femi mentioned Peter Tatchell. If life had been different, the fabulous and courageous Peter Tatchell today would have been one of my most gifted parliamentarians of a generation and not a human rights campaigner on the outside of that political system. But he was locked out because of the realities of society. And I freely accept that society is changing and that is a wonderful thing. But however hard we work today, it is a reality that the next generation of gay men and women will continue to have a tough time. And I don't doubt that the majority of people in this room will put every part of their energy into making that experience better, but there is a great deal of work to do. And in my ten minutes, I want to shine a little bit of a light of reality on what that experience is. And I'd like to start at my experience at, at university and I, I've never in the last 25 years spoken about going to university because I did a deal with my professor that if he gave me a degree in economic history I would join uh, the Royal Navy and never profess to have having had a degree before and this is the first time I've ever, I've ever spoken about it and I think he gave me the degree on the premise that if I joined the armed forces I'd never go back to academia. So I was about to join. It was May uh, 1998 and I was finishing off my final exams. I walked past the news agents in Elm Grove in Portsmouth and I bought a copy of the Radio Times, which is a bit of an odd magazine for a student to buy, but anyway. And I got back to my rooms and I looked at the front cover and I said to myself, very quietly, in case somebody heard under the door, I bought that because it had a picture of Michael Ball on the front. Now, please don't think of Edna Turnblad. Twenty years ago, Michael Ball was quite hot. <laughs> and that was a defining moment for me. I had three months before I was due to walk through the gates of Britannia Royal no Naval College Dartmouth. My mother had a fabulous idea that I would marry an admiral's daughter, I'd have two kids called Charlotte and Henry and a black Labrador and live in a cottage in the Mion Valley. 
And somehow I suddenly had to reconcile the fact that that would not be my life. But I thought about the fabulous service that I have known for the last two decades. And I thought, I want to do this job. It's exciting. I'm going to go to great places. I'm going to be involved in fantastic operations. And I'm going to do something which is fundamentally useful. And I'm no different to any other university leaver in that respect. So I put aside my sexual orientation for a few years and got on with a job and had an amazing time. And I deployed to the Caribbean to do counter drug ops. I went to the Northern Arabian Gulf and did helicopter fast rope insertions on the vessels clearing from the Shat al Arab and to many, many other places to do worthwhile operations, including a tour in Northern Ireland uh, in 1993 through 1995. And that was when life changed, because in the middle of 1993, while commanding uh, the Internet Patrol, which is the patrol along Carlingford Lock on the seaboard, I met my boyfriend. And then I had something to hide. An enormous challenge is at a time when the armed forces were literally hunting down gay men and women. They had cameras on the bars in Portsmouth and Aldershot, and the Special Investigation Branch were everywhere. And it was a worrying time. And it alienated me from the people around me and became a huge distraction for somebody who was trying to do really quite a challenging job that needed my full attention. And my period in Northern Ireland spanned 12 very difficult months before and following the ceasefire, a time when we had a unique opportunity to make a difference. And at that time, I was spending a fair bit of my time worrying about the whole process of going through having your first boyfriend at the age of 25. And I strongly recommend that you don't have your first boyfriend at the age of 25. It's a ridiculous age to do all that stuff. So please get it out of the way early. After that, uh, I joined HMS Sheffield uh, as the navigator. Sheffield was due to deploy to the Gulf at the beginning of 1995. Two days before the ship was due to sail, uh, Adams, my partner's father, dropped dead of a heart attack. And there was total chaos in the family. Adams' dad was the only person supporting him. And I had a very, very difficult choice to make. A choice between my service, and it's a service that I greatly love, or whether I protect and look after my partner. And over the next 48 hours, I worked out that I really needed to step back over the gangway and sort out what was going on at home. I couldn't be effective in my ship if I stayed. So I did a really fantastic piece of theatricals which would have made the gay community proud and went wibble, uh, and was taken off. I, I got the ship out of harbour, which is good, and we avoided the rocks, which was also great. Uh, and uh, I left the ship by helicopter a couple of days later. And my career had a couple of days, a couple of years of stalling. And that's a story which is familiar to lots and lots of gay people of my generation and not those, just those, who joined the armed forces who jo or who joined the clergy. It's a complicated life. So, on the 11th of January 2000, when the signal of repeal was received by military units all over the UK, in advance of the announcement on the 13th of January, I looked at that signal pad as head of operations of the Amphibious Assault Squadron, and my heart leapt. It was an amazing thing to see. But I also knew that it would bring real challenges. Um, the head of operations in any unit gets the signal pad first and takes it through to the captain. So I took the signal through to my captain, and I handed it to him, and I said, Sir, the signal has come in from the Admiralty to indicate that in two days' time, the ban on gay men and women serving will be repealed and we need to announce that to everybody. And he read the signal pad, and please note that I didn't name the ship, and he said, we have been fantastically let down, Craig, by the mandarins and the politicians on a European court that isn't even in our country. 
We are going to allow these dreadful people to serve with their immoral standards. And I have no idea whether this will succeed or not. And he called together his heads of department, of which I was one, a couple of hours later, and went through the same speech. And then on the 12th of January, he called together his officers and gave the same speech again. And that was the last one of those speeches he gave. Uh, I went up to see him two hours later and told him that if he gave the same speech again to the ship's company a couple of hours before the announcement in the House of Commons, that he and I would be going to see First Sea Lord. Uh, and I said that with a degree of fire. Military officers have a duty to lead and to follow orders and instructions even when they are challenging. And I made the point to him that I really did feel that he had missed that point. He was promoted three times after leaving that ship and has only recently left the military service. And that's why I mention it to you today. It is a reality, thankfully, that the dinosaurs die off in time. But it's a reality which I faced. We need to accept that in society today, there are many, many biases. Some of those are conscious biases. The biases, by and large, that Mandy and I have faced in our military service. But there are also lots of unconscious biases. And those need to be addressed. There are fantastic people in all walks of life, though. And I have to qualify when talking about my military experience the fact that I have had an amazing time. I have served with some incredibly inspiring men and women doing fantastic jobs, and I loved every minute of it. And it has been my great privilege to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. But there are times when it has been a difficult pathway. And I particularly remember one day on the 7th of January 2006, going into my back garden of my married quarter at Northwood headquarters and removing a Daily Mail journalist from my shed, Andrew. Because he thought it would be really funny to get an article about the fact that I was to be the first military officer to live in married quarters. And my partner has been doorstepped and photographed and placed on the front pages of various newspapers over the years that we have been together with headlines like, Hello Sailor, It's a New Naval Wife. I don't believe that gay people should have a special responsibility imposed upon them to fight for equality or human rights. We are ordinary people. So it is not fair to say that every one of us should be trailblazing. And I have never criticised my fabulous colleagues who are gay and who have decided that they don't want to be open about their sexuality. They accept a reality of the fact that it's a difficult climate. And I am delighted to say that there are some brilliant gay officers in the armed forces who are not out and who are enjoying fantastic careers. But today, the most senior of those is a commander. And that's not quite right. I absolutely want to see a gay admiral. And I want to see a gay out admiral. And I want to see a gay general. Because I'm not outing anybody, but they're out there. And when we have done our job, and when this proposition can be swept aside, it will be the case that those people are out. And we're not quite there yet. So I urge the House to support this motion because it is a motion of the realities. Every part of my being is committed to making the experience of the next generation very, very different. But we're not there yet. And if you don't support this motion, then you're saying that the job has been done. And the job absolutely has not been done. Thank you.
we've got Mark Simpson, a journalist, author and broadcaster, credited with coining the phrase metrosexual in 1994. He specialises in pop culture, media and masculinity and has been dubbed the skinhead Oscar Wilde. <laughs> Mark, thank you very much. <laughs> President. Ah, well, um, unlike the speakers that have gone before me and uh, have spoken very well, um, I don't claim to know very much about success. Uh, maybe that's your lot if you're a freelance journalist. You never really quite know whether you're successful or not, but I suppose being invited here, Madam President, is a form of success, um, but I'm no expert on it. The motion uses the word success. Femi has done a very good job of interrogating what success might mean. Um, and the opposition have done a very good job of pointing out the discrimination and the homophobia and the obstacles to success that exist if you are a same-sexer, gay, homosexual. What I'd like to do is um, argue that we have, not that we've come a long way, although that argument was made very forcefully by Lord Smith. Um, clearly we have. There's some way to go. And in fact, being brutally honest, it may never, that gap may never be closed. It, I mean, at what point would you know that everybody in the country was cool about homosexuality? When we have an Archbishop of Canterbury that's gay, or an Admiral that's gay, possibly, but even then we wouldn't really know. And, um, and I'm not going to argue about the inherent conservatism of an institution like the church and the armed forces. Um, I'm going to accept everything that the opposition says about discrimination and homophobia, fear and prejudice, and the obstacles to success if you're gay, that might exist if you're gay. And particularly outside of the metropolis, that was mentioned. I live in Darlington, and that's pretty provincial. Um, and, but even, even in a place like Darlington, things have changed enormously. But anyway, I'm going to accept all of that. Instead, what I'm going to say <coughs> is that I think that now is as good a time as any for lesbian and gay people to let go. And somebody upstairs said that it was dangerous to pretend that those obstacles weren't there. Well, dangerous isn't the word that I would use. I would say that it would be quite inspiring if, not that we pretend that the obstacles aren't there, but that basically lesbians and gays reject, and that it's already happened for so many young people today that they've rejected the idea of being victims, the idea of being a category produced by discrimination. On that point? Sorry? On, may I make a... Yes, by all means. It's all very well for uh, gays and lesbians to reject it, but if the people around them enforce it, that's, that's not going to work. Well, when you say, you say enforce it, enforce in what way? I mean that if it's going to be difficult for them to succeed based on the prejudices of other people, if other people are rejecting it in the way that you want them to, then their success is going to be hindered by that, no matter what their opinion of themselves is. Well, that's, that's true, but official discrimination has ended, and general attitudes have changed, Yes, there will be people who find themselves in situations where they don't want to come out because 
basically their, their situation will be uh, much more difficult. I don't think those are the general rule anymore, those kind of situations, but the point that I would make is that if you don't embrace the opportunity that's presented by the end of official discrimination and a, a, a revolution in general attitudes towards homosexuality, if you only focus on the discrimination and the homophobia, which, will, which does persist and may persist in some areas of society for the foreseeable future, perhaps forever. But do lesbian and gay people want to be the product of that discrimination? Do they want to see themselves as victims? I mean, the motion before us is the path to success is straight. Now that is a statement which, if you vote for, you're saying that effectively, it's not about saying, oh, we're pretending that there's no such thing as discrimination or homophobia. By endorsing that motion, you're saying that lesbian and gay people should think of themselves as challenged. That's the reality of the motion. And that's why I'm opposed to it. Because opposing this motion means letting go of that history. Not forgetting it, but not being defined by it. <clears throat> now, there's another side to that approach as well. Which is... What do we mean by straight? I don't think it's really so clear anymore what we mean by straight. Femi addressed this to some extent in her speech. But I, I mean in the, in the sexuality sense of the word. Yes, in the Church of England, it's got a very clear definition. It's not so clear for lots of young people out there who aren't members of the Church of England. Um, once upon a time, yes, 20, 30 years ago, straight meant married, 2.5 kids, all of those things that we call cliches now. Uh, but that was, that was the norm. That was, I mean, talk about a path and a narrow path, that was the idea of normality. Everybody knew what it was. I don't think most of the people in this room this evening share whatever their sexuality, I don't think they share, for good or for ill, I don't think they share that certainty about what normal is now. So again, even if you're not lesbian or gay, this motion is regressive and perhaps a little bit oppressive too. It isn't describing something in neutral and objective terms. It's prescriptive for everybody. That's why I say reject it. As a slightly controversial example of what happens <coughs> in a world where equality is officially recognized, okay. actually I won't bring that up because I've got, not got time, it's a bit of a complicated example. Um, <clears throat> so I'll just sum up and say that I implore you, Madam President, members of the House, to vote against this motion and to reject the 20th century view of the world that it represents.
Thank you, Mark. Before we end the debate, just a couple of announcements. This Saturday night um, is Union, which is a neon rave silent disco happening here. Tickets only a couple of quid, so do come along for that. Tonight, after the debate, we're having an LGBT pride party in the bar, and there's going to be themed cocktails and music, and it's free, so do come along to that. Um, you vote through which door you leave, eyes to the right, nose to the left, abstentions down the middle. Um, and can we just give our speakers a big round of applause to say thank you? Thank you.